Instagram only does an hour, right? That's okay. All right. Yeah, Instagram is an hour. I'm going to go on Instagram. Mila, no. This is going to be a problem. Uh, My mother left me with the crazy dogs. Uh, All right. I'm going on live, so are you ready to hop in? Uh, yes, I'm in Instagram. So the second you click it, I should be able to see it, and then I'll jump in. It'll probably be a few seconds delay, though. All right, bye. It says that I'm live. That was smart. So, I'm in your live. Johnny. Add. Hi, everybody. In about two minutes. There he is. All right. So, I don't know what is causing that. But in about two minutes, we're going to get started. Uh, we're going to talk. I think maybe we can't do both at the same time. Um, but we're going to get started. We're going to talk about injuries in sport. Um, I have my old teammate, the gold medal doc, Anthony, over here. Hey, Anthony, do you know if that's you or me? Something is uh, doubling up. You got it. If you have your uh, phone going, you got to turn off either the phone or the computer volume. True. Sure. How's that? There we go. Yes. Thank you. He fixed <laughs> it. I thought it was him. <laughs> All right, everybody. How's it going? Happy Thursday. In about one minute, we're going to get started. We're going to have a talk about athletic injuries with the gold medal doc, Anthony Sacramento. He is uh, one of my very good friends and former teammates um, from the University of Illinois. Um, it's seven o'clock exactly, so we're gonna get started. Um, so again, one more time, my name is Paul. Um, I used to do gymnastics for a really long time until I was 28 years old. And my old, one of my old teammates, um, his name is Anthony Sacramento. He is, um, we call him the gold medal doc. Um, he has been, you know, involved in gymnastics his entire life as well, and he is now a physical therapist. Um, he was educated. I'm, I'll let him talk about himself, I guess. But uh, my experience with him was um, pretty much that we went to college together. Um, we were on an NCAA championship winning team. Um, we won the NCAA title in 2012. Um, I can't remember how many Big Ten titles we won. Do you remember? Four. All right, four. That's a lot. Um, and, you know, we had a really good time competing together all around the country. Um, and, you know, something that, you know, we both were always interested in was um, sports medicine and injuries. And I had so many injuries myself as an athlete, so I know how important it is to um, deal with them and to address them, you know, before they're happening, while they're happening and after they're going on. Um, so I've picked out a bunch of things I wanted to talk, to, talk about today. And I have some questions from you guys as well, but, um, I guess I'll give the floor to Anthony. Just give us a little, you know, intro about yourself and, uh, tell us what, what you're about. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Well, thanks for having me here, Paul. It's really, really exciting to be able to, you know, talk to everybody about gymnastics and kind of some of the things that are happening in the health and wellness field and what we can do as physical therapists to kind of, you know, help everyone be better. Uh, so just like you, I did gymnastics for uh, as long as I can remember. So I think I was like two or three all the way through college. Um, and then after that, I started grad school, got my doctorate of physical therapy at NYU. Uh, and I've been a practice. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no but problem. since then, I've been a, uh, a practicing and licensed physical therapist in New York City. Uh, the, the office I work at is in Manhattan. Uh, and I've had an awesome opportunity to work with such a wide range of people from, you know, everyday people, you know, who just happen to have gotten hurt, uh, all the way to the professional athlete, which includes those uh, those gymnasts as well. So it's been a really awesome journey in, in the I think my background with the gymnastics and my own injury as well, I think I had like five different orthopedic surgeries over the course of my time in gymnastics, uh, definitely set me up and gave me a very different perspective on how I can, you know, best help and treat those in the physical therapy world, especially those involved in gymnastics. Yeah. What, um, what injuries did you deal with personally? Yeah. 
So the first one was a knee injury. Uh, I think I was 16. Basically what ended up happening is I wasn't getting enough blood to my knee. And so the bone and the cartilage started to disintegrate and fall away. I took an x-ray of it now. It looks like it took like an ice cream expert in my knee. It's really interesting to see, actually. Uh, but that was like 20 weeks on crutches, two different surgery to, to correct it. So that was the first two. The next one was in college, and that was my shoulder. So that was a slap tear. I tore at the beginning of the season, competed all season on it, actually, and then had it repaired that summer. Uh, number four was my meniscus. That was junior year in college. I was actually, it was my first time here in New York, actually. I was training at Dan's Gym, uh, who's another one of our uh, teammates at the University of Illinois. And I was practicing a triple back. I landed, and I felt like one exploded my kneecap, which was a great feeling. Uh, <laughs> so uh, after that, that was... Surgery was actually much quicker. I think that was only like four or five months out. Um, and then after that, I had just because I kept training on it for so long, uh, I just built up a whole bunch of like bone fragments that they had to go in there and clean out and remove and stuff. So that was the easiest one. But I think those are the five major, uh, which I think is plenty. I think that's enough. Yeah, that is plenty. I, I had quite a few myself, but I won't talk about it. I want to talk about more, you know, what you know, what you've been through. And, um, you know, I know you have um, a branded um, brand, essentially. Um, it's it's called the MoveWise Method, correct? Um, could you tell tell us all a little bit about that? Um, you know, for those of you that are watching, you know, you guys are coming in and out, we're going to be posting this on YouTube after. Um, and so don't be um, pressured to watch it now. We're going to be talking for a long time about a lot of stuff. So, um, why don't you tell us about the MoveWise method, what it is, how it was created, and what it's meant to do? Sure. So the original idea kind of generated from this fact that there's more to health than just taking care of someone who's already been hurt. Mm -hmm. right? uh, part of the problem is I think that the way we have things, up, things set up here in the United States and kind of around the world is that it's a uh, pathology-first approach. Like someone already has been diagnosed with something or they've already had a surgery. And now you're taking care of it. But there's just so much more to it from a wellness perspective. There's the nutritional side, sleep, hydration, what your training is like. Are you managing your load properly and everything else like that? So what we decided was that there was a, a real need that if we really wanted to treat people and get people better and hopefully prevent them from even happening in the first place yeah. is to develop more of a wellness program. So people knew more about their bodies. They knew how to take care of it. They knew how to manage it so they could stop it uh, before it ever became a significant issue. So that was kind of where it, where it all started from. So my partner and I created uh, the company MoveWise Health Studio and kind of our big thing is the MoveWise method. So it's a really highly individualized and comprehensive wellness program. Um, it's also got a lot of coaching components in there as well. And we have it based off of three different pillars, um, awareness, cleaning it up, and training it, which just kind of covers all the different facets from uh, like basic nutritional guidelines and health standards to a little bit of physiology to how to optimize your training and things like that. Um, and it really is designed to revolutionize how we approach training and specifically to the gymnasts, martial artists, and dancers of the world. That's kind of like our, our big group that we're trying to, to go with. Um, and yeah, like I said, it all covers mental health uh, and grit and mental preparedness and, and training principles. So that's kind of what, what it is um, in a nutshell there. Yeah, I like that. I feel like there's a, um, you know, there's not a lot out there. You know, it's something that we're missing for athletes, you know, especially myself. You know, um, I was an athlete at the Olympic Training Center after my collegiate career. And I also competed at a club uh, for a club in New Jersey called U.S. Gym. And, um, you know, I'm familiar with, you know, the needs, you know, that you're talking about, you know, and I think it's very difficult to, you know, it sounds great what you're doing, you know, like I said, it's, it's difficult to find something that conglomerates all the different aspects. And it sounds like that's what you guys are doing. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing more about that, you know, as we go on and seeing more about what, you know, you do um, with that in the future. Um, but basically... Now that we got that out of the way, you know, talked about your, your company and your product. Um, we know that you're a doctor in physical therapy from NYU. You were a former elite level athlete, you know, one of the best ring guys in the country. You know, you have a lot of experience. Um, so I wanted to go over um, injury prevention, um, specific injuries that you see. 
um, and a couple rehab, um, you know, pointers from you. Um, so I wanted to start in the beginning, you know, of injury prevention, you know, how uh, we can prevent injuries from happening. So my first question for you is, what do you think is the number one threat for gymnasts um, to get injured? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Without a doubt, it's, it's overtraining. It, it's such a highly specialized sport um, and done at a high level. They're very intense skills and you're asked on a very, very regular basis uh, to do it a lot. <laughs> yeah, you know, Most yeah. people are training six days a week and then you know maybe they have an hour of training room then they have they get there for an hour of conditioning beforehand then they have a three-hour workout then they have an hour uh, where they just you know stretch um, and try and work on problem areas so people are putting in five six hours of work six days a week and and that's just that's just a lot um, and gymnastics has always been one of those things where you know I think from a really young age your coaches our coaches I know my coaches would say you know, well, if you're missing days, like you either don't care or you're going to fall so far behind that you're just not going to be competitive. So there was always kind of that mentality to 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 go into the gym and do everything regardless, you know, if, if you got a bone sticking out or not. You know, that was just kind of that's just kind of we all have rip stories. Right. You know, one, how big was the size of your rip that you had to compete on you know, the size of your hand or something else like that. So it's not an unusual story to hear. Um, and because of that, that, that's just without a doubt where we run into trouble. Uh, the more you do things at that high of a level, the more fatigued you are, the yeah. more that impacts your technique, and that just sets you up for, for potentially an issue. You know, so when I think about what you're saying, you know, overtraining, um, you know, does that, you know, can we prevent this overtraining? You know, when I think about overtraining, I think about creating imbalances or weaknesses um, in muscles or your joints, you know, or in some kind of movement pattern. Is there any way to identify the overtraining or those imbalances, or the strength and weaknesses that are being created? Like, how would you suggest that we catch these, you know, situations where we're overtraining and can we identify it? Right. I think that's actually uh, two separate answers in there. So in terms of how do we prevent the overtraining, that comes down to coaches and athletes talking to each other and understanding where the other one is at and working together either with the trainers that they have or with other coaching staff or with hopefully a physical therapist that they have uh, to yeah. really design programs that have adequate rest, that have good buildup, that have built-in cool downs um, and, and realize that, you know, rest is not a bad thing, right? It, it's okay to take it easy and let your body recover. In fact, you'll perform better because you won't be fighting an injury and trying to compete on something that's hurt for long periods of time. That That's literally overuse, right? Um, and then the second one is how can we catch it in these imbalances? That's a that's a harder question to answer. Because as it stands, there really isn't a, a, a screen out there or something that's already out in the world to say, hey, you did this, this and this wrong, you're going to tear your ACL, right? That you can guess and, and people can look at strength and emotion and things that you would normally expect to hear at like the doctor's office, but that doesn't really capture the, sport. it's not very specific enough to, to give you an idea of what's going on. So really I think the best thing for that is, again, those coaching staffs, the parents and the athletes working with a, a, a PT uh, who is familiar with the sport, like on, on a very deep level, they can ask the right questions, they can have them go through specific uh, skills or movements to see where they might be having issues and basically do a top to bottom assessment and it have to be different for every single individual, right? That'd be the most ideal, which I appreciate is hard to, to do in some cases, not, not feasible, but that's really the best answer on that. So just to recap, you're saying that a healthcare professional, like a physical therapist can identify these, right? That's what yeah. you're saying. So is there, you know, I know we've talked about it before. Is there any way that we can, you know, I'm currently on the board of directors for USA Gymnastics. And one of the things that they're really, you know, focusing on is, you know, creating this athlete um, health and wellness program. And they've tried to do stuff like this in the past, um, but I don't know how it's really ended up um, benefiting or not um, to, in terms of the athletes. I think you're on to something. And I want to know, like, 
can we teach coaches? Because in my opinion, coaches are the first line of defense for injury. Can we teach coaches how to identify those? Because obviously coaches are not, you know, physical therapists. They don't have their doctorates, you know, in physical therapy. But is there any way that we can, you know, teach, you know, coaches about basic, exactly what you're talking yeah. about, you know, yeah. some, like a basic level, you know, that they can understand where imbalances are being created and they can, you know, address them as they happen. You think? One, yeah, I mean, 100%. 100%. Yeah, one you one hundred percent. We all have to learn it somewhere, right? You know, someone yeah. taught us. So honestly, I think it's probably the coach's responsibility to go and learn that information, because we got lucky. We were in a D one program. We had access to uh, any kind of doctor or, or trainer or PT that we needed. At you know, a phone. And a lot of people don't have that, especially in the club level, right? Just no, no private gym really has that. So for sure, I mean, go and educate yourself. There are plenty of cheap or even free uh, courses out there to kind of get the fundamentals of what to look like. Because really all they have to do is identify it, right? Yeah. If they can identify it, they can do something around it. They don't necessarily need to know what exactly it is or exactly how to fix it. They just need to know like, hey, this, this is a problem and, and then – take the appropriate steps. So 100% heart of hearts, absolutely teach all the coaches and anyone involved in that athlete's training. Um, and you'll, you'll have a, a healthier, stronger athlete all yeah. the way through their career. No, for sure. And, and just back to, you know, USA Gymnastics, you know, they, I, I really do believe that USA Gymnastics is trying to create an athlete centric, you know, transparent culture. And I think stuff like this is something that, you know, you know, the, the coaching culture needs to change slightly. And I think that this could be a huge asset or, or something like that could be a huge asset to the program. Um, but my next question, I know we talked before this conversation, you brought up um, stretching, you know, and how is stretching relevant to athletes injuries? You know, when I was an athlete, I saw a range and variety of some people stretched a lot. Some people stretched barely at all. You know, everybody was completely different. So I wonder, you know, as an older person now, oh, we have a question. Let's see. <laughs> Sorry. All right. The question is, we'll go back to that one. Would USAG mandate a course for coaches on key points to observe for injury prevention? So I can't speak, I know, hi, Nurse Lori, I can't speak about what they would do. You know, I'm only on the board. I'm not the organization. Um, but I can, you know, try to influence change within the organization. Um, we did just create, uh, you know, if, you, if you've been noticing the, the, I don't know if you're a coach or not, but a lot of the coaching uh, courses have been changing in USA Gymnastics. So we've been having a lot more education on, you know, abuse, obviously, given the situation. Um, so I think this could be something that would be great for coaches, you know, to understand um, like, like, uh, exactly what you're saying. A, a course on, you know, injury prevention and athlete, you know, they do things like this, obviously, at Congress and you know, other you know, regional Congress, national Congress. They have PTs and um, I know Marla from New Jersey does a lot of stuff, um, but you know, um, we're just trying to, you know, make a difference and try to make the experience better for the athletes. So I think at some point this will be getting better. But back to stretch sack. What do you? What did you want to bring up? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. So no, I mean, I think you, you you kind of hit the nail on the head. Like you saw everyone doing different amounts of stretching, right? Some people you would just be frustrated, like. They never stretch. How, how, how come they can do that? And I'm stretching here for, you know, like five hours and it's not making a difference. Yeah. Uh, and to me, I think that comes down to identifying what you actually need. Um, from the, the youngest gymnasts, you know, they're getting pushed into over splits and, and the importance of flexibility. I mean, in the Future Stars curriculum, there's an entire routine that is purely flexibility, right? Yeah. But what happens when it's not flexibility you need, but some kind of strength or some kind of motor control? So what ends up happening is your body needs to find stability somehow, right? I don't care how loose your joints are or how flexible you are. If you don't have that stability, your body's going to tighten up everything just to keep it together, right? So then when you go and stretch it and you take all that away from it, 
you can't use it. And so then you go and you try and do the skill and, and nothing changes, right? And so you need to be able to identify, is this truly a flexibility issue or I'm just tight and I need to stretch? Or am I tight because I'm lacking that strength or I'm lacking that stability somewhere else? And so I'm stealing that flexibility away just so that I can move through the routine. You know, and you'll see that if you have specific sticking points on certain skills, right? That's absolutely a question you need to ask. Number one, can my body actually move into that position, right? Yeah. And then do I have the, the strength to, to handle it? And then if you still have a flexibility issue, go ahead and stretch it. Uh, but stretching is definitely not the only answer. And honestly, what I find, especially in the gymnastics population, is, which is already very hypermobile, is that's actually not the answer at all. And more flexibility doesn't change anything. So, you know, pick and choose when to use it and, and, be, and be sure that you're using it for the right reasons. Sure. Um, that makes a lot of sense. My next question would be with regards to, you know, when I was an athlete, you know, I remember in college even, you know, we were required to do prehabilitation shoulder, you know, exercise before we worked out. Um, do you believe in prehab? Is it useful? Should we throw it away? You know, what do you think? Yeah, uh, absolutely prehab, right? Okay. The, the problem again lies in the type of prehab that most athletes are doing. You know, I see these big old ring guys and they got these tiny little bands and they're just moving their arm up and down, you know, and it's like, what are you doing? It's yeah. just not, it's not specific enough. It's not intense enough. It's not challenging enough to actually be effective, yeah. right? Um, and it also needs to target what needs to be strengthened, right? Just because you have a shoulder issue, we were just talking about the difference between um, flexibility and, and stability or strength, right? You might have a shoulder problem because you have a thoracic spine mobility issue, right? So doing more shoulder rehab isn't going to help you, and it's not going to prevent anything because you're missing the point, right? So that needs, again, to come down to a good understanding of where you actually need to supplement that rehab or prehab, and then make sure it's specific and intense enough to actually do good for you. So I have a weird question. I'm going to go. This is a more personal yeah. question for me. When I was an athlete, I was, you know – I remember many different times people did diagnostic exams on me and they always picked out my winging shoulders, right? My winging scapula. They always, t I mean, even from age 12, I'm telling you, I remember at Future Stars, they told me I had winging shoulders, winging scapula, and I needed to fix that or I was going to destroy my shoulders, right? So I didn't hurt my shoulder. I mean, I had, you know, minor shoulder injuries up until, you know, six months before Olympic trials in 2016. I also got a slap tear. But I don't necessarily believe it's because of my winging problem. You know, I don't. I think that's just how my body is built, you know. And I think that I was very strong and, sorry, I was very strong and very, you know, capable of, you know, what I was doing. I just wanted to bring up the winging thing, if that was something you ever come across yeah. in, in um, evaluating athletes, <laughs> what you thought yeah. about it. Yeah. yeah, all the different <laughs> things, you know, between the winging scapula to the hyperextended knees or the hyperextended elbows and the, the super yeah. loose low back arch. It's, we're built the way that we're built. Right? It goes to understanding your own body and appreciating what it can do and then designing a program around it. You know, we, we I talk a lot about, at least in my patients, their clients, you know, it works until it doesn't, right? And so you might have a problem and never, ever, and that's just that's just life. Yeah. And so you can't get caught up on every little thing. Everyone's built differently. No one's going to have the perfect ideal anatomy in all cases, right? So I think I, I think you're right. Um, and and again, you you we're not a huge ring guy, right? You, you didn't need the same kind of stability. Uh, that someone else might have needed, right? Yeah, you, you're stronger. Yeah, you're stronger events. You did floor vault, high bar, p bars. I mean, you were great at those events, and you needed the flexibility, and you had the lines to to make it work. So it wasn't even important, right? So again, event give and take. Work with your anatomy. Whole, yeah. Same same deal. No, I think I, you're, I, I, think feel like I you know, as an athlete, that was my strength. You know, I always picked out you know what works for my body. But uh, anyways, recovery. What do you think is the most valuable piece of recovery for you? Is it compression? Is it icing? Is it heating? Sleep. Is it, say it again. Sleep. Sleep. 
All sleep. right. Why sleep? Tell me why sleep. <laughs> All those other things are great, right? Yeah. You, you want to use the ice or the heat to, you know, work out inflammation or something tight. Making, say, making sure you stay hydrated and drinking water and, and good nutrition. That's all important. But it doesn't mean anything if you, if you can't recover. Yeah. And the recovery yeah. itself actually happens during sleep. Our yeah. body has a bunch of different processes that it goes through while you're in a good, deep, restful sleep that just can't be left, uh, replicated by anything. There's no ice machine or compression sleeve out there that's going to replicate what, what sleep does for your body. Um, and all those other stuff just kind of it can't even be used to their full effect if you're running off of no sleep. Yeah. So if you had to prioritize one thing in your training on recovery, get some sleep. Go to bed before midnight and try and get a full eight, nine hours. Um, younger people need even more, sometimes closer to nine, 10, 11 hours, depending. So sleep 100% <laughs> number one. <laughs> and I always did. Um, thank you. That was really good, um, really good information. Um, I wanted to move on to the, the second part of the three um, topics that I wanted to cover, but the second topic being injuries, right? So let me ask you, Mr. Gold Medal Doc, what injuries I would want you to pick two for men and two for women do you see the most in athletes, gymnasts, in your yeah. opinion? For sure. Two of each. Um, and after you pick them, I'll, I'll remind you once you explain each one, I want you to show me what you think is the most important rehabilitation exercise or prehab exercise to maintain or to, to prevent that specific injury from happening. So two for men, two for women, and then show us one specific exercise for each injury. Sure. So for men, it's, it's, it's definitely the shoulder and the ankle. Uh, okay. there is men as opposed to women gymnasts do a lot more with their upper body. There's a lot more blocking floor and vault. You s have the swinging, uh, events with, um, rings and high bar and parallel bars. And then you're on your arms even more when you're on pommel horse. So the, just the amount of arm use, uh, in men is just completely different than the, the four women events. Um, and ankle is because of more of the explosiveness, the types of, uh, tumbling passes and vaults that they're doing. With a couple of exceptions, uh, I'm sure you can name a couple, Simone Biles being the most obvious one, uh, the, the general type of tumbling passes that men are doing are, are a little bit more um, advanced um, than the women, right? So your body needs to be able to absorb all that impact. It needs to be able to generate that power to get up into the air to do it. Um, and so you see a lot of torn Achilles. You see a lot of coming down on the ankle wrong and breaks in that way. So for men, it's definitely in the shoulder and the ankle. Uh, for women, it's going to be the low back and the knee. Uh, okay. With, with this, the style of women's gymnastics, a lot of that big extension out of the low back in the way that they land and the way that they present and a lot of the dance moves that they do, and just the fact that they're generally more mobile than men, all that repetitive extension just wears away at the spine and they end up with, with back issues. Okay. Uh, and the other one is knee. It, it goes back again to the hypermobility thing. Uh, they tend to hyperextend in their knees more, and they don't necessarily have the, the strength, not all, but some don't necessarily have the strength to handle those landings. And so you get this knee collapse. And even the general anatomy for women, knees are a little bit more on that. It's called a valgus angle. They go in a little bit more. And when you have landing mechanics like that, it just, again, wears down at the knee, and over time you have issues. Okay, so let's go back through each one, and I'm going to have you show us an exercise that you think is most important for stabilizing that joint. So I think you said for men, ankle. Sure. sure. What do you think sure. most important? You can demonstrate or explain. I know you're in, he's in New York City, guys. Forgive him. He doesn't have a, like, a huge house to play around with. He's in, uh, where are you exactly? Tell everybody where exactly you are. I'm in Queens right now. All well, right. Yeah, sunny side comes in with his near, near Long Island. It's a beautiful place. But show, <laughs> show me, um, show me your ankle prehab. <laughs> rehab. Sure. Well, let me move some things around here. Sure. Uh, uh, let's see. Or if you want to explain it with your hand or something, you can. I don't know if you can do that, but anyway, you want to show us. Anyway, anyway you want to show us. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll bring my camera down a little bit. I'll, I'll do a mini one. I'm not going to embarrass myself right now. Uh, but, but the first one is called the wide panel. So basically you're doing single leg squats in three different directions. Okay? okay. Forward, back out into the right, and back out into the left. And you do it on both sides. Right? Okay. Um, and it seems like I said squatting, right, which should be a leg exercise, but it's really the ankle because you need to have the range of motion of your ankle and that balance component to really actually be able to get out into that, into that distance, right? So, uh, yeah, so if I can, I can bring at least this camera down, right? Yeah, you can hold that, but yeah, just, just pop the angle down. Yeah, and then you can just bring it downwards. I guess yeah, your feet. <laughs> perfect, perfect. So anyway, you stand on one leg, and basically you just try and go out as far as you can and back out. Knee needs to stay in line. Heel can't leave the ground. The next direction is back into the right, and then it's going to be back into the left, and then you just repeat on the other side. So it's foot forward, it's forward, back left. Okay, I understand. So you make a Y, like an upside down Y. Yeah. Right. And then, right. and what's actually really cool about it is that uh, it's one of the few tests that we have that's fairly predictive of, of an ACL injury. And right. You, too much of a discrepancy from your right to left leg in that forward direction, yeah. it actually places you at a higher risk for an ACL or knee injury down the line. So yeah. at least something that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, go to the next one. For men, sure. your second injury or second joint, uh, most acceptable, most susceptible for injury was a shoulder. Right. So this one I call terrible five. It's basically five different exercises with five reps that you do five times. Okay. What does it work the, the whole shoulder in all the different directions? So it looks something like this. Start with your arms out, gently squeeze those shoulder blades like this. One, two, three, all the way to five. Five in this direction, five in this direction, maintaining that resistance on the band. Five all the way up and down, and then keep it there. And do five squats. Mm, I like the squats. Yeah, very cool. It's like a snatch. <laughs> snatch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right, women. Uh, I think you said low back. Yes. Okay. So low back. You're gonna forgive me. This is a little bit harder to to demo, but they're they're called chops and lift. And if you know what a chop and lift is, it's basically a rotation in either an upward direction or a downward direction. Okay. So yeah, you can look that up. So imagine this is. Over there, so someone's it's attached to something. Okay, you're in this nice half kneeling position, uh, chest squared off, 90 degrees at the knees, and you start down here. The whole idea is that there's no, no up and down of the spine like this. Stay okay. vertical the whole time. You bring it up to your chest this way, and then you push up in that direction, and okay. then you bring it back down. And again, you get that rotation. But you then have to stabilize with your abdominals, which is why it's a, a low back exercise. So you get that right. rotation stability, which is what you do with any setup for any twisting skill, right? Yep. So stay nice and tight, rotate, push up, and come back down. That would be the lift. And then the chops, the anchor would be up here. And then you would just do a push down, well, I guess in this direction, it would be this way, right? Sure. Like this. So chops and lifts for the low back. Cool. Um, and the fourth one was women and knee. Squat. Just squat. Just squats, really. What kind of squat? Yeah, so kind of, like weights, like weighted air. squats? Nope, just an air squat. You could do some weighted if you wanted to, but you could also just put a band around your knees. And what that's going to do is the band's going to try and push your knees inward. So you're going to have to push it out. And you have to push out to resist it. And then that'll get those glutes involved, which is what helps stop that knee collapsing, which is really the main mechanism of injury there. And then squat. Because that's your landing mechanic, right? You squat. You squat every time you dismount. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Oh, this will be my exercises. I never thought about that, but those are really good. I like the, the squatting one. Um, one more question about the squat. Like a regular, like, feet underneath your hips or, like, wider with your heels? I would do all variations. Okay. Right? The, the landing mechanic, the feet are touching, basically, are very close together, so you need to make sure you can do that as well. But yeah. a, a real squat is about shoulder width apart, which is a little bit farther, right? And so just having the ability to go through a full good squat, meaning go like your chest drop forward, 
don't let your heels pop up. There's a lot of quality involved to the squat. Um, so, you know, coaching and guidance on all of these, it's going to be important to make sure you're doing it right. Because, you know, a thousand crappy squats is just a thousand crappy squats. It's not going to help you at all. Right? Um, but, yeah, be, be creative. Do a different variety of it. Um, and, and that's going to be your best answer. Okay, awesome. Um, so we went through injury prevention, uh, what you thought about it. The top four injuries, two for men, two for women. Um, you showed us a couple exercises for each joint that you think that everyone should be working on in order to prevent those injuries. Um, but the last thing I wanted to ask about is actually actual rehab. You know, obviously we're not dealing with an injury here. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of athletes struggle with, you know, their rehab, you know, if someone's not on top of them, you know, or if they're not going to a physical therapist every day, um, which, you know, given the state of insurance and God knows what, you know, it, it's difficult for people to have um, a physical therapist on staff unless they're at the Olympic Training Center or something. Um, so how do you suggest, you know, athletes stay motivated and not get caught up in mundane, you know, boredom, you know, doing their exercises? How do they keep it interesting? Because... I think they got to keep it getting harder and harder, you know, in order for them to keep wanting to get better. You know, what's the most important thing to keep in mind, you know, as an athlete going through rehab? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Um, for me, it starts for me, with appreciating what your body has to go through. Body has to go through. Right? Sure, right. I don't care who you are, how good of an athlete you are, what kind of legend you are. Your body heals at the same rate as everybody else. There's no yep. research anywhere that said anyone can heal faster than you. What you can do is you can facilitate that by all the things that we talked about, getting good sleep, hydrating, nutrition, good load management, and everything else like that. But it takes time. And, and most healing takes about six to eight weeks for basic things. And then for something that's a little bit more intense, you might be looking at eight to 12, right? That's three months if you're counting. That's a long time. So get, get that mental toughness, get in your head and understand that it's, it's a time commitment. Right, and, and going faster um, or trying to push yourself harder is just going to prolong the process because you're just using something or overusing something on the other side and causing a different problems. That's how people constantly get that cycle of their hurt every single season. Something happens in some other body part, but without fail and around the same time every year. Right? Um, so that's the most important thing. After that, it goes back to collaboration. Making sure that you're talking with your coach, talking with the therapist and the doctor that you're working with, or surgeon if you end up having a surgery, and really designing a program and working with people who know the sport, right? Like I said before, you know, those big ring guys doing the band stuff, it's not helping and it's not working in the because it's not intense enough, right? Yep. So if, if you're really that bored by it, you're, you're not doing the right stuff. So speak up. Talk to your talk to your coach, talk to your therapist, and, and let them know where you, where you're at with all of that. Um, if they design the program appropriately, you'll find that it's it's challenging enough, and it'll keep you. Busy. And then you'll be able to go through your thirty days uh, and get back on your feet, competing better and, and quicker than before. Um, that's really amazing. Um, thank you for the advice. Um, I. I am out of the questions that I had prepared for us, but I did something else did pop up into my mind. I just wanted to go over, um, cause you know, you mentioned, uh, recovery and we're talking about rehab. Um, you know, as an athlete myself, and I hate, I really hate when, you know, I, I, I'm sorry for bringing up my experience, but we as athletes were encouraged to try all these new, you know, things, you know, game ready machines, um, the Normatec pants, you know, I love Normatec pants, you know, I love, you know, the game ready machines. I love, you know, going in a hot tub, cold tub, getting massages, you know, um, deep tissue massages all the time at the end of the Stim, you know, like I, 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 I personally felt that the most effective form of athletic training or, you know, pain management rehab for me was oddly cupping seemed to work. Cupping number one and number two was acupuncture. Um, oh. And I, I just, I, I wanted to ask you out of all those things that I just mentioned, what do you, you know, you can use your experience as an athlete or as a healthcare provider, which ones do you think are the most important to 
rehabilitation or recovery, I should say. Yeah. Um, so, so like like most things. Right. So, so I'm, I'm certified. I, I, I can do that. I do it all the time. I, mean, I have great results out of my patients. Right? I've done the Kinesia patient. I've, I've, I've done all the things. And what you find with, with experience I've had with working with so many different people, and so many different walks of life, and so many different capability levels, is that something works differently for someone else. Right? Yeah. Just because it works over here doesn't mean it's going over here, even though it seems like they have the exact same of course, it's, it's just two individuals, right? Of course. So that I think that comes down to, and really understanding that athlete and gymnast, what you got, and listen, listen to what they have to say. Right? If they say, "Hey, look, I hope that this is doing anything," don't push the, don't push it. Find something else. And that's what any good clinician, any good coach is going to do. Um, so a lot of communication in that. Um, but they, they all have their use, right? So you can find research on all those things that work in different ways to varying levels of success. Uh, and really, you're still finding one that works for that person. I personally had acupuncture, but I know people who care about it, right? Great. Go for it. How do you feel about Graston? Yeah. So uh, I, I, have a, I have another presentation in, in tool use. So I, I've, I've done a lot of things. But it's a different brand, and it's a different time, even though they actually originated from the same place. Um, and I have my one problem with Aston is the power of the country. Yeah, Bruce. So yeah. you can use those tools in a lot of great ways. I think most of it's neural networks where you're creating a small window where you can create change. And I think the people who love to say, oh, you know, like, push harder, dig harder, and dig in with the tool, and I want to see the bruising, uh, I, I think they need something else. I don't think the tool is the right choice for them because their body is saying that they need something else. And normally their body is saying they need more stability. And when your intervention is, is creating massive, massive bruising, it's just tissue damage, right? What it is, right? When you're creating that much tissue damage, I, I question the, um, the rehabilitative component of it. Sure. No, that, that's fair enough. Um, thank you, Anthony. Um, I guess, Nurse Lori, do you have any other questions for us on Instagram? Or anybody else, any of a few of you guys on here, uh, we're going to be posting this to YouTube after we're recording it on the computer. Um, so we're excited to be posting it. Um, but Anthony, do you have anything else you wanted to bring up or did you wanted to talk about um, before we end the call? Yeah, I get sure. I guess my, my last take is to collaborate. Find it. Find it. Find it. Uh, understand the support and we're going to work with you. Make sure that you get all people involved from the coaches to the parents um, and, and everyone else involved in that office and make sure they're on the same page and make sure it's good if they're not. We just can't stay on enough. And hopefully with all this information that's coming out and hopefully the, the platform that you're providing here and the information that you're providing, we start to see some changes in the way that we're training our, our young gymnasts um, and all the way up into the college level. That's really my, my greatest wish to see how we how we change and improve the sport um, with with health in mind. Right? And then just as a as a shameless plug, don't forget to subscribe and follow my uh, YouTube page, Get Metal Doc, as well. Um, I'll be posting a lot of stuff, gymnastics, martial arts, everything else in between. Um, so check it out. There's gonna be a lot of good information on there. Um, and I'm, I'm open to all your questions if you want videos or information or something to say. Yeah, awesome. Guys, I just wanted to say um, that, you know, Anthony is really, really, really knowledgeable. Um, you know, he was an elite level athlete, uh, national champion, collegiate league, went to NYU, you know, a lot for his um, doctorate program. You know, a lot of, you know, athletes don't achieve those levels of high, you know, and after finish. So really use him as a resource. And um, I personally have a lot of respect for him and what he's you know, been through and learned. So uh, please follow him, you know, ask any questions. You can ask me questions as well. Again, we're gonna be posting it on YouTube. Um, I'm gonna be posting it up on my page, um, Paul Ruggieri. 
Um, it'll be on Anthony's as well, Gold Medal Doc. So please give us both a follow and a shout out. Hopefully everyone's staying healthy during this, you know, COVID pandemic. And um, as we're talking, I'm getting my little CNN uh, uh, little pieces of news pop through um, on my phone. And uh, it's just painful to listen to. But um, I miss you, my friends. Uh, thank you for spending the time. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your Thursday evening. Maybe we'll do another talk um, coming up in the future, right? Absolutely. I, my pleasure. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Have a good night, Anthony. Bye, guys. <laughs> See you later. I'm going to end the Instagram. Here, I'm going to... That was bad. It doesn't matter. I'll stop. I'll stop for time. <laughs>